9 April 1943. Dear Diary, today, as always, my day began with an early rise. Perhaps many of my peers might consider this unnecessary, but I have always maintained that success does not come to those who lie in bed. My early lessons in willpower and determination began as a child, when I realised that the world obeys those who are not afraid to get up before others. After a quick exercise and a walk in the park where my thoughts could float in free flow, I headed to school. Here, on the Quidditch pitch, I could show everyone my strength and skill. I admire this game. It emphasises the importance of tactics and strategy, qualities I have always loved. After class, I secluded myself in the library. Knowledge is the key to my power. I delved deeply into magic and its intricacies, studying every page, every phrase. Many may find my devotion to study strange, but I know that only those with knowledge can rule the world. In the evening, I spent time in my room pondering my plans for the future. A world full of possibilities stretches out before me. My goal is to exceed all expectations, even the most daring ones. I will not settle for less. I am on my way to greatness. Every day is a step towards my goal. I am willing to walk through fire and water to reach my place in history. My strength, my wisdom and my will will lead me to heights that others dare not even dream of reaching. I am Tom Riddle and nothing can stop me. Tenth April. 1943. Today was filled with challenges and opportunities like every other day. The morning workout strengthened my muscles and mind, preparing me for the greater challenges that lie ahead. In class, I have once again shown my ability to understand and control magic. I stand out among my peers, not only because of my intelligence, but also because of my coolness and confidence. These are qualities that cannot be underestimated in a world where power and authority determine everything. After school, I spent hours in the library, studying ancient tomes and learning the secrets of magic that lurk within their pages. My ambitious nature demands that I strive to understand what most would consider unfathomable. For in this knowledge lies the power to lead me to grandiose successes. In the evening, I immersed myself in thoughts of how to use my abilities and knowledge for the good of the magical world. My plans for the future expanded and strengthened with each passing day. I have seen the weaknesses in this world and I am ready to use them to my advantage. But to do so, I must remain vigilant and steadfast in my aspirations. My path to greatness may be difficult and dangerous, but I will not let a single obstacle derail me. My determination and quest for power will guide me through the dark times and uncharted expanses of the magical world. I was born for greatness, and nothing will stop me from achieving my destiny. Eleventh April, 1943. Today proved to be an unusual day. After class was over, I was encouraged to duel with one of the junior high school students. His name was little known to me, but his self-confidence and challenge to a duel called my attention. We gathered in the wasteland outside the castle. There was silence all around. Only the rustle of leaves and the rustle of our breaths mingled in the air. I could feel the fire of competition inside me, the thirst for victory. The duel had begun. My spells were precise and powerful, and my confidence was unshakable. I controlled my magic with ease, dodging and retaliating. My goal was clear, to win. But when my opponent began to relent, I decided to add an element of surprise. I summoned a serpent from the surrounding thicket and aimed it at my opponent. His scream of amazement and consternation was music to my ears. I smiled, feeling the power and control fill me. After this incident, my peers present looked at me with renewed respect and amazement. I had demonstrated not only my prowess in combat, but also my capacity for power and control. 
This only confirmed my position in the Hogwarts hierarchy as one of the strongest and most powerful students. My dual victory and the serpent challenge was just another step on my path to power and greatness. Nothing can stop me in my endeavors. I am Tom Riddle, and this world must prepare to see my greatness. Twelfth April, 1943. Today passed unusually for me. Among my peers, conversations about meeting girls began to emerge. They discussed their feelings, the excitement and joys of their first romantic experiences. I thought it was something ridiculous and meaningless. I watched them from the sidelines, genuinely not understanding what makes them waste their time on such trivialities. Love, romance, emotion, all of it seemed superfluous and unnecessary to me. My strength and power over magic was what really mattered to me. Perhaps I underestimated the power of human feelings, but my rationality and desire for power kept me from delving into the world of emotions. It was more important to me to develop my magical skills and build my future on knowledge and power. Nevertheless, watching my peers, I reflected on how different the paths of each of us might be. Time will tell where their romantic pursuits will lead, but I remain confident in my path to greatness, which does not include the concept of love. My ambition will be my true partner, my path to power will be my primary goal. Love may have been important to them, but to me it remains an empty and meaningless concept. I am Tom Riddle, and my destiny lies in magic and power, not romance and emotion. Thirteenth April, 1943. Dumbledore. That name brings out something more bitter in me than mere annoyance. He, the old wizard, considers himself a sage, but all I have seen in his eyes is hypocrisy and lies. His power and authority seem meaningless to me, and his meddling in my affairs causes only anger and disgust. Dumbledore sees himself as the guardian of morality and justice, but to me, he is only an obstacle in my path to power. His attempts to control me and direct my steps only strengthen my resolve to topple him from the throne he so arrogantly occupies. I have never understood why Dumbledore thinks his affairs concern me. My goals and aspirations are higher than his limited vision of the world. He pokes his nose into the affairs of others without thinking of the consequences of his meddling. My anger towards Dumbledore has not clouded my judgment. I have always been convinced that my actions are the only way to achieve greatness. He may consider himself a sage, but I know that true power lies in controlling myself and my surroundings. Dumbledore may continue to play his part in this comedy called Hogwarts, but I will not waste a moment to prove my unrivaled power and wisdom. My will to power and desire for greatness will lead me to victory, no matter what. 14th April, 1943, Hagrid. This huge man, with his naive character and glib tongue, inspires nothing but contempt and ridicule in me. He apparently considers himself a guardian of nature and a benevolent giant. But to me, he is nothing more than a weak link in the chain. Hagrid often spreads rumors and says a lot of unnecessary things without thinking anything through. His gullibility and naivety make him vulnerable and an easy target for those who know how to use his words and trust against him. In the future, I intend to use his naivety and stupidity against himself. I know I can manipulate his mind and draw him into my intrigues by presenting myself as his friend and ally. But in reality, Hagrid will only be a pawn on my chessboard that I will use in my games of power and influence. My goal is not just to defeat him, but to expose his weaknesses and flaws to the entire magical world. I will not miss the chance to humiliate him and show everyone his true face, the face of weakness and stupidity. Hagrid may think he's a harmless giant with a kind heart, but I know that behind his kindness lies only weakness, which I will definitely use for my own purposes. 
15th April, 1943. Snakes. They have always attracted me with their mystery and grace. In my free time from schoolwork, when other students are engaged in mindless entertainment, I prefer to spend my time surrounded by these beautiful creatures. My ability to communicate with snakes and understand their language has become my unique gift that I have always valued above all else. Snakes are a symbol of strength, wisdom and mystery, and I feel that they reveal their secrets to me when I am in their presence. Mental conversations with snakes have become not just a way for me to relax, but a source of inspiration and insight into magic. Their wisdom and resilience have always inspired me to do great things and allowed me to see the world from a new perspective. Snakes are not subject to human emotions and weaknesses. They are exceptionally honest and direct in their actions. This makes them the perfect companions for me in my quest for power and greatness. Surrounded by snakes, I feel free to be myself without unnecessary masks and illusions. Time spent with snakes fills me with renewed energy and determination. They are my loyal allies and trusted advisors in my journey to power and greatness. I am sure that with their help, I will reach those peaks that many people think unattainable. Sixteenth April, nineteen forty three. Today proved to be a particularly important day for me, for it brought recognition of my abilities and labour amongst the esteemed Professor Horace Slughorn. In class, he expressed his admiration for my knowledge and skills, calling me his best student. This recognition from Slughorn not only validated my talents and efforts, but also reinforced my position at Hogwarts as one of the brightest and most promising students. I have always strived to stand out amongst my peers, and Professor Slughorn's recognition was a confirmation to me that my efforts are not in vain. This moment reaffirms my belief in myself and my abilities. I feel that my goal is becoming more attainable and I am ready to keep moving forward no matter what. Recognition from an outstanding teacher like Horatius Slughorn inspires me to even greater achievements and pushes me to new heights. It is now my task to not only maintain my achievements, but to surpass them. I must prove that I deserve this recognition and that my place at the top of the magical world is unalterable. Every day I will work hard to achieve my goals and rise even higher. 17th April, 1943. Today has been full of unpredictable events and the fidgety nature of young children. In my role as head boy of Hogwarts, I have to worry about order and discipline in the school, but sometimes even the youngest students can be a challenge to my patience and attention. Unruly little ones often ignore the rules and forget their responsibilities, which creates additional difficulties for me as head boy. Instead of focusing on my own tasks and studies, I have to spend time and effort to convince them to follow the rules and instructions. As head boy, I have to constantly be on guard and monitor the behaviour of all students, regardless of their age. This requires me to be highly organised and responsible, but sometimes even my best efforts may not be enough to keep the little troublemakers at bay. Nevertheless, I am not going to let disobedience and disorder in the school become a regular occurrence. My duties as head boy require me to be strict and decisive, yet fair and tolerant. I will continue to carry out my duties with honour and perseverance to maintain order and discipline at Hogwarts. 18th April 1943. This day proved to be overly stressful and annoying thanks to one of the younger students who decided to test my tolerance and endurance. From the very beginning of the morning, this little fellow, as if thrown out of control, began to cause trouble and chaos all around him. He ignored my instructions, distracted other students, and created a mess where I was trying to maintain order. 
my tolerance was severely tested and I could feel the irritation building up inside me by the minute. I tried to hold on and keep calm, but this little student kept testing my nerves with his naughty behavior. Finally, my tolerance ran out and I had to take action to restore order. I sternly expelled this junior student from the class and gave him punishment for his disobedience and disorderly behavior. This incident reminded me that even the smallest of obstacles can turn into serious problems if not given proper attention. I will be vigilant and determined to maintain order in the school to prevent similar situations from happening again in the future. Holy Merlin, children can be so unbearable. Nineteenth April, nineteen forty three. Today brought with it forbidden adventures as I decided to venture into the Forbidden Forest. Contrary to the warnings and prohibitions, I felt that my desire for knowledge and exploration was greater than any restrictions imposed by the sages and rulers. The forest had a mysterious atmosphere filled with mystery and danger. I could feel the adrenaline in my blood as I walked its ancient paths, sensing that each step could lead to a new discovery or challenge. Despite the dangers, I felt no fear rather excitement and thrill. My curiosity and thirst for knowledge dominated my mind, pushing me forward in this forbidding place. Encounters with local forest dwellers, such as hippogriffs and centaurs, only strengthened my conviction that my decision was correct. I felt like an explorer plumbing the mysterious depths of the magical world, ready to discover all its secrets. When I returned to Hogwarts, I felt renewed and refreshed, full of impressions and new knowledge. This adventure had not only strengthened my determination and ambition, but also confirmed my place in the world of magic as a consummate explorer and learner of mysteries. Twenty April, nineteen forty three. Death. It is a concept that often causes fear and anxiety in people. To me, it represents something vague and mysterious that can hardly be understood or mastered. Although I won't admit it out loud, I cannot hide my fear of the inevitability of death. This thought permeates my musings and makes me wonder what might happen after this life is over. My ambition and quest for power may give me a sense of control over myself and the world around me, but in the face of death, I am just as vulnerable and helpless as everyone else. My strength and power may allow me to dominate the world of the living, but in the face of death I am only human, subject to the same fears and unknowns as everyone else. Nevertheless, I will not allow this fear to rule my life. I will continue to move forward, striving for greatness and power despite the inevitability of death. My will to power and my ambition will be my weapons in this struggle and I will stand firm in the face of the unknown, ready to overcome any obstacle to my destiny. 21st April, 1943, Abraxas Malfoy, this young man causes me some misunderstanding and irritation. He is the son of the arrogant and ambitious Enceladus Malfoy, who seeks power and influence in the world of magic, just as I do. While Abraxas possesses certain qualities such as intelligence and cunning, I can't escape the feeling that his ambition is not great enough to be a true adversary or ally. His arrogance and haughtiness make him predictable and limited in his actions. We have clashed several times in the past, and each time I have been left disappointed with his behavior and decisions. He seems to me too limited by his family ties and unable to go beyond the expectations of his own kind. Nevertheless, I cannot ignore his existence. Perhaps in the future, he can become some factor in my plans or even become an ally in my ambitions. But for now, I remain dissatisfied with his superficial approach to life and his lack of ambition. I need allies who can see greatness and power as much as I do. 
Abraxas Malfoy so far does not fit that criteria, and I will continue to watch his development with doubt and hope for the best. Twenty tenth of April, nineteen forty three. Today was another example of Avery's undisciplined behaviour, who again forgot to hand in his essay on time to Professor Slughorn. It seems that his inability to cope with his own responsibilities is becoming a regular occurrence, much to the annoyance of me and the teachers. Despite this, I realised again that Avery's respect for my opinion and his recognition of me as a leader does nothing to change his behaviour or attitude towards responsibilities. While he may recognise my authority and seek my approval, his own indiscipline and inattention to detail prevent him from achieving his goals. I certainly appreciate respect and recognition of my authority, but it is important to remember that leadership requires not only recognition from others, but also the ability to behave accordingly and act as an example to others. Avery may recognise me as a leader, but I hope that he can also comprehend the importance of discipline and responsibility to achieve true leadership. Twenty three April, nineteen forty three. My mother. She was and still is a source of complex and contradictory feelings in my soul. On the one hand, I feel a deep hatred for her for abandoning me, leaving me in the care of an orphanage. I consider her weak and unimportant, unable to cope with the difficulties and failures that everyone faces in this life. But on the other hand, I can't deny that deep down I have a desire to see her, even if it causes me painful feelings. After all, despite everything, she remains my mother, and I feel an inner desire to be close to her, if only for a moment. To understand how she feels and how she is. Sometimes I wonder what my life would be like if she had stayed by my side. Maybe I wouldn't be as strong and determined as I am now, but maybe my childhood would have been happier and filled with care and love. But these are just idle musings, for the reality remains the same. My mother, like any other, is human and imperfect. While I can hate her for her actions and decisions. I also cannot deny that she remains a part of me and my past. My hatred and desire to see her again continue to battle in my soul, but as always, I remain steadfast and determined to walk my path forward. Twenty fourth April, nineteen forty three. Today brought with it some interesting conversations and unexpected news. As I walked past a group of students, I overheard a conversation that said that Armando Dippet was planning to appoint Dumbledore as headmaster of Hogwarts in the future. This news couldn't help but make me uneasy and displeased. Dumbledore is someone who always stands in the way of my ambitions and aspirations. If he becomes headmaster, it could create more obstacles in my path to power and influence. I cannot afford to remain indifferent to this turn of events. My plans and ambitions cannot be jeopardized because of a decision made by others. I must be prepared for every possibility and respond accordingly. Although I recognize that my discontent may be seen as selfish and personal, I cannot deny that my own interests and ambitions play a key role in my reactions. Ultimately, I have to think about myself and my future, and no one should stand in my way of power. Twenty-five April, nineteen forty-three. After the day I heard of Dumbledore's possible appointment as headmaster of Hogwarts, I realized that I could not allow this news to distract me from my own affairs and plans. While decisions made outside of my control may affect my outlook and ambitions, I cannot let them undermine my resolve and determination. I must stay focused on my goals and keep moving forward, no matter what. My ambitions and aspirations for power do not depend on other people's decisions or circumstances. I must act boldly and decisively in pursuit of my goal, despite any obstacles that may come my way.
This day was a reminder to me that there is no room for weakness or hesitation in the struggle for power and influence. I must be prepared for every possible scenario and act accordingly to ensure my success and achievement of my goals. Thus, I have decided to raise my ambitions and work even harder to not only achieve my goals, but to surpass them. I am not going to let anything or anyone stand in my way of power and influence in the world of magic. Twenty sixth April, nineteen forty three. McGlawborn. This is a subject that causes me bitter disgust and resentment. I hate them not because of what they are in their origin, but because they are a threat to our world of magic. Muggleborns belong to a world of magic that they cannot fully understand or control. Because of their connection to the world of magic, they become a source of trouble and danger to all of us, magicians and wizards. Not only are they unable to adequately perceive and control magical power, but they create conflict and strife, preventing us magicians from living in peace and tranquility. Their presence in our world creates misunderstanding and hostility from ordinary people, which makes our lives even more difficult and dangerous. I cannot look at Muggleborns without feeling disgust and hatred. They are the cause of many of our problems and disasters, and I am ready to fight them to the end to protect our world of magic from their harmful influence. Muggleborns may consider me prejudiced or cruel, but I cannot just stand by and watch them destroy our world. I am willing to use every means and opportunity to protect our community and keep it safe and prosperous. Twenty seventh April. 1943. Deep inside me lives an envy of the Slytherin children who can be proud of their parents and enjoy their support and love. In their eyes, I see the awe and respect they have for their parents and feel a bitter sense of inadequacy and loss. Unlike them, I have no reason for pride or joy when it comes to my parents. My father abandoned me and my mother left me, and I was forced to grow up in an orphanage, deprived of love and care. It is my father who evokes in me a special feeling of hatred and resentment. He is a symbol of betrayal and indifference, who rejected his son and left him to his fate. Every time I think of him, a hot wave of anger and despair erupts in me. But at the same time, I also feel self loathing for not being able to relive the past and forget my suffering. It is a weakness that prevents me from moving forward and achieving my goals. But I commit to myself that I will never give in to these feelings. I will use my pain and anger as motivation to become stronger and more influential. And no envy or hatred can stop me on my path to power and greatness. Twenty eighth of April. 1943. Today was an ordinary day, similar to many others. I spent it like a normal teenager, but as always, alone. I woke up in the morning and went to class, interacting with teachers and peers the way everyone else does. However, even on this ordinary day, I remained in my own world, absorbed in my own thoughts and plans. While other teens could enjoy conversations with friends or plan evening outings, I preferred to stay in the shadows and ponder my future. I exchanged a few words with Avery during the day, but our conversation was superficial and brief. We discussed our studies and some current events at Hogwarts, but nothing else happened. I always try to keep my distance from others, even those who consider themselves as my friends. I returned to my room in the evening and spent the rest of my time immersed in reading and studying magic. It is my solace and a way to escape from a reality in which I feel alien and misunderstood. Although this day was ordinary and didn't stand out in any way, it was another step on my path to power and greatness. Every moment spent alone has brought me closer to achieving my goals, 
and I cannot allow myself to be distracted from this journey for even a moment. Twenty ninth of April, nineteen forty three. Today was filled with a strange sense of discontent and discomfort due to Dumbledore's constant presence in my life. All day long I felt his eyes following me, as if I was the object of his constant scrutiny. This constant attention began to take its toll on me, making me feel uncomfortable and reminding me to be careful and keep my emotions in check. Dumbledore is a man who is always ready to expose my weaknesses and flaws, and I can feel his eyes penetrating to the very depths of my soul, examining my every move and decision. I can't allow myself to relax or show my true self in front of him. My emotions must remain hidden and controlled so as not to give him any opportunity to manipulate or interfere in my affairs. Every time I feel his eyes on me, I remind myself to be cautious and vigilant. My goals must remain my secret, and I am not going to allow Dumbledore or anyone else to interfere with my plans. Thus, I will continue to proceed with caution and determination knowing that my future depends on my ability to keep control of my emotions and keep my goals a secret. April 30th, 1943. Today I realized that the name Voldemort is not just a set of letters, but a symbol of my ambition and power. This name is imbued with power and authority, which I strive to acquire and hold in my hands. I like the way this name sounds, menacing and mysterious, causing respect and fear in those who hear it. This name will become my sign and symbol, which will be used only by my faithful companions in our closed circle. Voldemort is not just my name, it is an expression of my ideals and goals. This name will stand at the top of the pyramid of power that I am building and will inspire awe and respect in those who choose to follow my path. My loyal companions will now call me that and it will be a sign that they share my beliefs and are ready to follow me in the struggle for power and greatness. This name will be my weapon and shield, protecting me from enemies and supporting my mission. Voldemort is not just a name, it is my mark that will be forever glorified in the history of wizarding. And I am ready to do everything possible to make this name a terrible and powerful symbol in the world of magic. May Fun, 1943. Today was an important day in my life as I introduced my new name to my associates, Voldemort. I felt that this name best reflected my ambitions and desires for power and greatness. And my colleagues appreciated this name just as much as I did. They understood its meaning and significance in our circle, and I saw respect and admiration shine in their eyes when they addressed me by this name. This was the moment I had been waiting for and hoping for. Seeing that my teammates approved and supported my new name, I felt confident that they were ready to follow me and help me achieve our common goals. We have become even closer, united by a common goal and respect for each other. My comrades understand that the name Voldemort is not just a name, it is a symbol of our strength and unity that will inspire us to great deeds and victories. Today has confirmed my confidence that I am on the right path to power and greatness, and I am ready to move forward with my faithful companions by my side, ready to support me every step of the way. May 2nd, 1943. Today, like so many other days, I found myself once again in the role of head boy ready to help the younger students with their homework and problems. Although my nature is not inclined to be compassionate or benevolent, I realize the importance of helping others and sharing my knowledge and experience. Younger students often come to me for help, knowing that I can give them the advice and guidance they need. 
while I am not looking for friendship or recognition in their those in need. Eyes. I realize that my role as head boy entails certain responsibilities, including helping today. I spent some time explaining to one of the younger students complex concepts from a magic book that he found confusing. I tried to be patient and clear in my explanations so that he could better understand the topic and complete his assignment. May 3rd, 1943. Nothing unusual happened today. I'm still immersed in helping the younger grades with homework while thinking about my plans. May 4th, 1943. Today I unwittingly ran into Myrtle Warren, that whiny girl who wanders the halls unhappily and cries. I've met her before, and every time I see her, she seems miserable and weak. I have never understood such people who allow themselves to show their emotions in public places. Crying and expressing your weakness in front of others is something incomprehensible and unacceptable to me. Tears for me have always been a sign of weakness. There is no room for tears and complaining in my world. I believe that strength lies in controlling your emotions and being able to overcome obstacles without showing weakness. Meeting Myrtle Warren reminded me of how weakness and vulnerability can make one vulnerable and unprepared for the harsh reality of the world. I can't understand how someone can be so defenseless and let their emotions rule them. So when I encountered Myrtle Warren, I just walked by without paying attention to her. Let her cry. It means nothing to me. I'm not going to waste time and energy on those who can't deal with their own problems. I don't need tears and complaining in my life. I follow my own path, focusing on my ambitions and aspirations for power and greatness. Feelings of weakness and vulnerability only hinder me from achieving my goals. I may seem indifferent and insensitive to some, but I don't think my attitude towards tears and weakness is wrong. This is my conviction, and I am not going to deviate from it. May 5th, 1943. After I passed Myrtle Warren, nothing much happened. I continued my walk through the corridors of Hogwarts, absorbed in my thoughts and plans for the future. Meeting her did not leave any special impressions on me, except for the thought that tears are a sign of weakness. Despite this, I felt some confusion about Myrtle's behavior. Why was she crying? What happened to cause her such strong emotions? I couldn't understand why someone could show their emotions so openly and vulnerably. May 6th, 1943. Today was the day I was once again convinced of my dislike for broom flying. Flying on a broom is not my thing, but I decided to attend the Quidditch match to support my team. As I approached the Quidditch pitch, I tried to hide my lack of enthusiasm, preferring to stay in the shadows and watch from afar. But, as always, my attempts to remain unnoticed were unsuccessful, and I had to join the crowd of fans. The match was lively and exciting, but to me, it was just a theatrical performance in which I had no interest. I watched the game with indifference, wondering how people could be so passionate about the sport. As always, the Gryffindors won, demonstrating their superiority on the Quidditch pitch. I watched the event with some indifference, realizing that this match was just a waste of time and energy for me. In the end, I left the Quidditch pitch without a shred of regret for missing the opportunity to do something more productive. There are more important things for me to do than chasing a ball on a broomstick. May 7th, 1943. Today, I watched Dumbledore show his unfairness once again by awarding points in favor of Gryffindor in transfiguration lessons. This is not the first time I have seen him bias our house, limiting our successes 
and favouring Gryffindor's advantages. This constant disregard for our efforts and accomplishments irritates me. Dumbledore only sees his Gryffindor favourites and is willing to resort to any means to ensure they win, even if it means ignoring the talent and efforts of other students. I feel that this injustice must be stopped, and I intend to take action to protect Slytherin's interests. Dumbledore has no right to play biased games in class, and only allocate Gryffindor deserved points. I will monitor his actions and will not allow him to continue his biased practices. My fellow Slytherins deserve fairness and equal opportunities in lessons, and I will fight for their interests to the end. May 8th, 1943. Today passed as usual, a day unremarkable and without much happening, except for one incident which I witnessed. I spent most of the day deep in study and reflection, remaining in my own world and avoiding unnecessary contact with others. My thoughts were preoccupied with my plans and strategies, and I was unwilling to be distracted by external trivia. However, at one point, as I passed a staircase that changes direction, I witnessed a near accident. One of the students, moving too leisurely on the stairs, almost fell down the stairs, barely keeping his footing on the edge. This incident reminded me that even in harmless situations, something unexpected and dangerous can happen. Although I didn't take much interest in what was happening and didn't intervene, this incident served as a reminder to me not to be too careless or careless, even on normal days. So I continued on my way, putting the incident behind me, and went back to my classes, not letting myself lose concentration over the little things. May 9th, 1943. The night was quiet and peaceful, but as always I was alert and ready for anything to happen. Walking through the corridors of Hogwarts, I noticed movement in a dark corner and decided to find out what was going on. To my disappointment, I found a student who was clearly breaking curfew by wandering around the school late at night. It was clear to me that this could not go unnoticed, so I decided to intervene. Approaching him, I sternly pointed out that he had broken the rules and should return to his dormitory immediately. My words were brief and ruthless, and I expected him to obey immediately. The student at first tried to justify himself, but seeing the seriousness of my gaze, he immediately gave up and went to his room, realizing that it was not worth resisting. This incident reminded me of the importance of rules and discipline in school. No one should feel above the law, and I was willing to use whatever measures necessary to maintain order and discipline at Hogwarts. After the student left, I continued on my way, convinced that it was my duty to keep order and safety in the school, even if it meant taking unpopular measures against those who broke the rules. May 10th, 1943. I witnessed an interesting conversation with Professor Slughorn today. During our conversation, he expressed his surprise that I had more information about what was going on in the school than he did himself. This is not surprising, given my natural tendency to observe and analyze everything going on around me. I am adept at gathering information from a variety of sources, whether it be conversations with other students, observations, or even rumors that spread around the school. It surprises me that Professor Slughorn doesn't realize this or acknowledge my ability to possess information. Perhaps he is too focused on his classes and research to pay attention to such trivialities. However, I'm not going to reveal my sources or share details about how I get all the news about the school. It is my privilege to have that access to information, and I have no intention of divulging it. So I just smiled in response to his surprise and said that I'm just attentive to details and interested in what's going on around me. No further explanation needed. Let Professor Slughorn think it was just a result of my diligence and observation. If I'm not careful, he'll suspect me of something, and I don't want that. 
I've been trying to gain his trust for a long time, and it's been hard to do. May 11th, 1943. After our conversation with Professor Slughorn, I continued my day as usual, going about my business and plans. I spent the rest of the day in the library, researching and reading books, enjoying the quiet and solitude of the place. Here, among the shelves of books and the atmosphere of knowledge, I feel at home, free from the vagaries and anxieties of everyday life. In the evening, I return to my dorm to continue working on my projects and studying. Although I could have gone for a walk or socialized with other students, I prefer to stay in solitude where I can fully focus on my tasks and goals. So after our conversation with Professor Slughorn, my life continued on its course, steadily moving forward towards my goals. May 12th, 1943. Orion Black and his family are longtime acquaintances of mine. Their surname is well known in the world of magic. One of the oldest and most powerful wizarding families, the Black family is renowned for its tradition, wealth, and extreme devotion to pure blood blood. Orion himself is an outstanding representative of his family. He has a sharp mind and charm although I have always noticed in his eyes a hint of arrogance and disdain for those he considers less worthy. The Black family has always stood out for its cruelty and uncompromising attitude towards Muggleborns. They adhere to strict traditions and raise their descendants in accordance with these beliefs. Relationships with them can be difficult and dangerous, especially for those who do not live up to their high standards. I have always been attracted to the power and influence that the Black family has. They are at the center of the magical world, determining its flow and shape. Relations with Orion and his family always remained on the surface, formal and cautious. Despite their influence and status, I prefer to stay aloof and follow events from afar, maintaining my independence and freedom of action. May 13, 1943. My peers. An interesting category of people. I see a diversity of characters, talents, and ambitions in the world of Hogwarts, but their commonalities often give me mixed feelings. There are those who show persistence and diligence in their studies, achieving high results. I respect their pursuit of knowledge and success, but I often see a narrow-mindedness and conformity in their eyes that makes them predictable and uninteresting. Other peers show leadership and have charisma, attracting the attention and support of others. They can be influential and inspiring, but often their power is based on superficial qualities rather than true fortitude. Some of my peers show themselves to be excellent magicians and masters of magic. I admire their skill and talent, but I often see them limit themselves to their skills in magic without developing other aspects of their personality. But among all these qualities, I have also seen flaws and weaknesses in my peers. Some show ambition without morals, seeking power and success at all costs. Others are too gullible in trusting their friends or are influenced by those who are not worthy of their trust. Overall, my peers are a mosaic of different characters and qualities. I observe them from my own perspective maintaining distance and caution in my interactions. There's just one thing I don't understand. Sometimes I have noticed how foolish they are. Gullible fools. Can one rely on the loyalty of friends? Can one even for a moment let a weapon out of one's hands? May 14th, 1943. Trust is a concept that has always caused me doubt and bewilderment. How can one trust others unconditionally when there is so much deceit, hypocrisy, and betrayal in the world? 
I don't understand how you can reveal your deepest thoughts and feelings to someone else when there are so many risks of those secrets being used against you. For me, trust is a vulnerability I can't afford. My trust issues began as a child when my mother abandoned me. This act of betrayal left a wound in me that has never fully healed. I feel that people can always turn out to be unpredictable and volatile, which makes me stay away from them. Maybe it's my weakness of not being able to trust others, but for me, it's more of a defense mechanism that helps me maintain my independence and keep control over my life. I prefer to rely only on myself and my own strength than to take risks and trust someone else. So I will continue to remain wary and extremely cautious in all my dealings with others. Maybe one day I will find someone I can trust in a real way, but until then, I will remain at my post, guarding my gullibility and my secrets. May 15th, 1943. Dear Diary, Today I decided to get an unusual pet, a small snake. Unlike the owls, cats and toads that inhabit the Hogwarts castle, this snake appealed to me because of its mysterious and exotic nature. I picked it up on one of my walks in the Forbidden Forest, where it seemed utterly alone and helpless. I can't say my motivation was altruistic. Rather, it was driven by my desire for something new and unusual, something different from the ordinariness and routine of my daily life. For now, I hid this snake under my bed so that it wouldn't attract undue attention from other students and faculty. I realized that having a pet that is not listed as allowed is not the safest idea, but I decided to take the risk for the sake of fun and uniqueness. Naming this snake is something I haven't decided on yet. Maybe I'll call her Slicko in honor of her flexibility and slipperiness. Either way, she will be my faithful companion and secret ally in a world where trusting someone is hard and finding a loyal friend is even harder. May 16th, 1943. I discovered something interesting today that got me thinking about my pet, a snake, and how it fits in with other animals not listed as allowed at Hogwarts. It turns out I'm not the only one who has acquired an off-list pet. I overheard a conversation between a few students who were whispering about Hagrid keeping a spider in his trunk. This piqued my interest, and I decided to do some investigations of my own. While watching Hagrid, I noticed him go into his room a few times and do something in his drawer. After he left, I couldn't resist investigating. Upon opening the drawer, I discovered that there was indeed a spider inside, large and unfriendly, as it is supposed to be. This discovery made me wonder what might be behind Hagrid's actions. What was he thinking of when he had such dangerous and enormous animals? However, in any case, I'm not going to get involved or find out for the time being. I've taken the information to my lips and I'm going to use it later for my own purposes. May 17th. 1943. After discovering the spider in Hagrid's trunk, I decided to ignore it and keep my distance. After all, it was his business, and I didn't want to draw unnecessary attention to myself or cause further trouble. Instead, I focused on my own business and pursuits. I continued to develop my wizarding skills, learning new spells and experimenting with magical formulas. My snake remained hidden under my bed. I continued to care for it in secret from others. However, despite my efforts, the incident with the spider in Hagrid's chest made me think about how much is hidden from me in this world. Hogwarts hides many secrets and mysteries, and I felt that I was only touching them superficially, remaining outside the circle of those who know more. This made me feel impatient and eager to uncover all the secrets of this place. I resolved to be more careful and cautious in my observations, to look for confirmation of my suspicions, and to be ready to act if anything suspicious happened. So although the incident with the spider had no immediate consequences for me, it did fuel my desire to unravel the mysteries of Hogwarts and my own destiny in this world of magic. May 
May 18th, 1943. Throughout my studies at Hogwarts, I have tirelessly explored every corner of the castle. Recently, I had learned about the Chamber of Secrets. From the beginning, I believed that the Chamber of Secrets might contain the answers to my questions about my parents. But when I unexpectedly discovered the truth in a completely different part of the castle, it didn't stop my efforts. My parents weren't outstanding pure blood wizards like the Blacks or the Malfoys. My father's muggle blood and my wizard mother's poverty would only emphasize my vulnerability in the eyes of my peers. This disappointment I had to accept and reconsider my plans. I decided to start with a clean slate and create an image of a wizard who would not depend on lineage or wealth, but would wield absolute power and influence in the magical world. My plan may seem ambitious, but to me it was perfect. I was willing to make any sacrifice to achieve my goal. No matter how dangerous it might be, or even ridiculous, I was determined to do anything to become who I wanted to be. May 19th, 1943. The search for the Chamber of Secrets became an integral part of my life at Hogwarts. Even during classes and studying, I couldn't stop pondering the possible locations of this mysterious room. I could not allow myself to relax and miss any hint or clue that could lead me to the truth. All my efforts are aimed at unraveling the mystery of my origins and finding the place where the answers to my questions might be stored. Even so, I did not forget about my studies. I realized that only by possessing knowledge and skills would I be able to achieve my goal. So I continued to study, improve my magic skills, and carefully watch the world around me for any hints or indicators of the presence of the Chamber of Secrets. My day was filled with classes, but in every spare moment I had, I returned to my search efforts. Twentieth May, 1943. My day began, as usual, with my studies. I listened attentively to lectures, took notes, and participated in practical classes, even though my mind was occupied with the search for the Chamber of Secrets. I spent every spare moment studying old books in the library and chatting with those who might have some information about the whereabouts of this mysterious room. I managed to strike up a conversation with some upperclassmen who had been at Hogwarts for a while and might have known something useful. Although many of them turned out to be not talkative enough or didn't have the information I needed, I wasn't discouraged and continued my search. 21, May 21st, 1943. During my lunch break, I met with Avery, with whom we discussed not only current academic matters, but also my secret quest. Although he didn't reveal anything specific to me about the Chamber of Secrets, our discussion encouraged me to come up with new ideas and possible areas of search. After finishing my studies for the day, I returned to my room and continued to study the materials I had found and take notes. Even though my efforts had not yet yielded the desired results, I was not going to give up. My goal was too important to put off for later and I was ready to continue my search until the very end. May 22, 1943. There was a conflict between two students in Slytherin today, which I, as head boy, had a duty to resolve. When I learned of the incident, it was clear to me that this situation could not be allowed to get out of hand and damage the reputation of our house. I invited both parties to a private place and tried to find out the reasons for their disagreement. As I listened to both sides, I realized that the root of the problem lay in misunderstandings and accumulated resentments. I had to use all my persuasion and diplomacy to reconcile them and find a compromise solution. I persuaded the students to voice their grievances and frustrations and then help them to find common ground and find ways to resolve the conflict. In the end, we reached an agreement that satisfied both sides and I believe that this experience made our house even stronger. May 23rd, 1943. Defense against the dark arts was one of the favorite subjects of Hogwarts students. Slytherin and Gryffindor students were particularly attentive listeners. There was perfect silence in the classroom. The fifth year students of both faculties were fiddling their quills in unison. Even Avery, who usually found it hard to sit still, was completely engrossed in Professor Wilkos' lecture. Anyone can be subject to the curse of the puppet. It doesn't matter if he's a wizard, a squib, or a muggle. I thought this phrase was ridiculous, but dutifully wrote it down in my notes with everyone else. 
Lectures on unforgivable spells had become comical since some time. The war with the dark wizards in Europe had warped the minds of the officials in the British Ministry of Magic. Avada Kedavra, Cruciatus and Imperius had disappeared from newspapers and textbooks. If the ministry hoped that this would discourage young wizards from learning forbidden spells, they were clearly mistaken. May 24th, 1943. In my search for the Chamber of Secrets, I discovered many other Hogwarts secrets. One of them was an old wine cellar in the dungeon, just off the kitchen, hidden behind a statue of a nymph holding a jug. In the time immemorial, when a cup of alcoholic beverage in the hands of a student was not frowned upon, the cellar was full of huge oak barrels. Now there were only dark traces of them on the floor, and the smell of wine had long ago replaced the bitter odor of the herbs that dried on the racks along the left wall. There too stood cauldrons of various sizes and kinds, copper, bronze, silver and gold. Mulsebert's approach to potions was meticulous. He had bought distillers and vials of all shapes, and his cupboard of ingredients was constantly being replenished. I wondered what else I would find. So far my quest was still ongoing, but I was sure I was close to my goal. May 25th, 1943. At dinner, I was completely immersed in my thoughts and devoured the food slowly, not even tasting it. The topic of choosing the right object to create a horcrux was on my mind. I wouldn't want it to be a fountain pen or shoelaces. The problem was that with the advent of magic in my life, most of the things I valued before had lost importance. I needed something that reflected my personality to the fullest, the power that is hidden within me. Studying information on artifacts didn't help, only fueling my greed even more. Slytherin's medallion, Candida's diadem of claw, Gryffindor's sword, Penelope's cup of puff and dewy. I couldn't settle for less. But getting these items wasn't going to be possible anytime soon either. I had to think of something else. May 26th, 1943. Every time I sit in class and listen to Dumbledore promote goodness and love, I can't avoid feeling irritated and tired. To me, it sounds like empty words, devoid of real meaning and significance. What can all this unobtrusive wisdom about kindness and compassion give me? To me, they are just idealized concepts that have no place in the real world. Dumbledore, with his endless morality lessons, seems to live in his own world of illusion, where kindness solves all problems and wins in the end. But I don't believe in this rosy image of the world. In my world, power and authority rule the ball, and the weak are subjugated. May 27th, 1943. The summer holidays are coming soon. It is simply intolerable for me to be in the orphanage during the summer holidays. Every year when that time comes, I feel the suffocating circumstances of my life shrinking around me. This place reminds me of my past, of where I came from, of what I am trying to leave behind with each step. Here, in this shelter, there is nothing but reminders of my unwantedness and uselessness. Instead of being somewhere else where I could reach my potential, I remain here, among those who are incapable of understanding me and who want to see me as nothing but a burden. I need to convince Principal Dippet to keep me on summer holidays. I can't afford to spend another summer in this hell. I know it's not going to be easy. Principles aren't easy to convince, especially when it comes to my situation. But I'm not giving up. I'm willing to do anything to stay out of this damn orphanage and start living for real. May 28th, 1943. What a cheeky one. Today, one of the Gryffindors just ignored my personal boundaries and meddled in my affairs without asking. He must think that his friendly invasion of my privacy would bring me some benefits or even improve my mood. But no, it has only made me dislike him more. I don't need his attention or friendship. My affairs are my affairs and no one, I repeat, no one has the right to interfere in them without my permission. That Gryffindor must think that everyone around him owes him obedience and obeys his whims. Well, he's wrong. May 
May 29th, 1943. After that incident with the Gryffindor, I decided to leave him alone and not continue the conflict. Although his violation of my personal boundaries irritated me, I decided not to waste my energy on useless arguments. It was more important for me to get back to my business and make time for my personal goals and plans. I realized that my reaction may have seemed unnecessarily harsh, but it is important for me to maintain my independence and personal space. I am not willing to allow anyone else to interfere in my life without my permission, and I decided to just walk away from this incident. May 30th, 1943. Suffering and pleasure are two powerful forces that govern our actions, our desires, and our decisions. Ultimately, we all strive for pleasure and try to avoid pain. When a person becomes the source of both suffering and pleasure for others, he gains power over them. This is a principle that is used in power and influence. One who can bring joy or relief from suffering becomes valuable to others and can control them. For me, these words remind me of the importance of understanding human nature and using this knowledge to achieve your goals. The ability to control and manipulate human emotions is a strength that can lead to heights of power and influence. May 31st, 1943. The school holidays are approaching and I have mixed emotions about it. On the one hand, I am glad to have the opportunity to take a break from studying and spend time outside the walls of Hogwarts. This will be a time when I will be free to do my own thing, learn new things and conduct experiments without the restrictions that the school schedule imposes on us. On the other hand, holidays also mean returning to my haven, which reminds me of where I came from and my past that I am trying to forget. I can't stand the thought of having to spend another summer among people who don't appreciate or understand me. But perhaps this will be a good opportunity to concentrate on your own affairs and plans. June 1st, 1943. Today I decided to ask Professor Slughorn about Horcruxes, a powerful magic spell I managed to read about in one of the old books in the library. This spell could be the key to my quest for power and control. When I approached the professor after class, I asked him a question about Horcruxes, trying to see if he knew anything about them or could give any guidance on how to study them. The professor listened to me carefully and looked at me thoughtfully. He recognized that Horcruxes were very complex and dangerous spells and that studying them required special care and caution. Although the professor did not immediately give me specific advice, his reaction did give me hope that studying Horcruxes might be possible. I concluded to myself that this was not a dead-end path, and I was willing to make every effort to unlock their secrets and master their power. June 2nd, 1943. After I asked Professor Slughorn about the Horcruxes, I noticed the attitude towards me became more cautious and attentive. He seemed to be watching my actions and words with more care, as if afraid that I might be acting carelessly or overly ambitious. This new attitude of the professor gave me mixed feelings. On the one hand, I was glad that my question about Horcruxes had caught his attention and made him look at me in a new light. On the other hand, I realized that I should be more careful. June 3rd, 1943. Tonight night I decided to go in search of the Chamber of Secrets. A long time passed as I wandered the corridors of Hogwarts, carefully avoiding encounters with teachers and other students. Finally, my persistence paid off when I discovered drawings of engraved snakes in the girls' restroom above the sink. My inner fire erupted with joy and excitement when I realized that this was the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets. My target was so close that I could feel it on my fingertips. I cautiously approached the drawing, filled with a sense of triumph and pride. The next step was to find a way to open the entrance. I began to study the drawing, looking for any signs or magical signs that might help me. My mind was full of determination and perseverance, and I was willing to do anything to overcome this final barrier to my goals. June 4th, 1943. With a sickening satisfaction, I made my way into the women's restroom, using a reversal potion that helped me bypass all obstacles and get inside without arousing suspicion. Using the liquid I mixed myself, I had no trouble clogging the toilet. Iron pipes and faucets cracked under the pressure, and ceramic tiles cracked and fell to pieces. 
It was an act of vandalism that gave me satisfaction not only because of the destruction, but also because I knew it would cause chaos and disorder in the school. A few days later, I stood back and watched Winter's nasty squeeze a nail into the restroom door and hang a sign that read, closed, out of service. Winter's the elderly squib had a nasty temper, a creepy appearance and a heavy hand, but he was good at what he did. Anything Winter's repaired without magic never broke again, perhaps out of fear. Knowing that, I did my best to break things down properly. And I clearly succeeded. Squib was in a bad mood. Muttering curses to himself, he rolled the creaky tool cart on his way. I waited until he was around the corner and went into the restroom. Stepping back, I hissed in Parcel Tang, open up. And then I saw the secret room open before me, revealing a tunnel to the coveted place. June 5th, 1943. My heart beat harder as I realized that I was one of the few who had been able to find this mysterious room and overcome all its obstacles. But as I approached the depths of the Chamber of Secrets, I encountered something that sent me into a state of true excitement and anxiety. I met the basilisk dot the glittering eyes of this terrible creature cast a sizzling gaze upon me. But instead of running or trying to attack it, I decided to address it. I spoke to the basilisk, trying to understand its language and gain its sympathy. Despite its terrifying appearance and threatening behavior, I felt that conceivable creatures, including magical serpents, could be useful allies on my path to power. The basilisk, strangely enough, realized immediately that I was the heir to Salazar Slytherin and obediently obeyed me. That was to my advantage. June 6, 1943. It was a day filled with excitement and danger as I went hunting in the Forbidden Forest. Despite the prohibitions and warnings, I decided to explore this dark forest in search of prey for the basilisk. Armed with my spells and skill, I made my way deep into the forest where every rustle and shadow could hide danger. With every step I felt the adrenaline rush, preparing myself for the wild beasts and monsters that inhabited the place. My skills as a hunter and magic mastery helped me track down and kill several beasts large enough to satisfy the appetite of my faithful companion. I felt like the king of this dark forest, feeling a sense of power over its inhabitants and surpassing them with my strength and skill. When the hunt was over, I gathered my prey and returned to the Chamber of Secrets, where the basilisk was already waiting for me, radiating hungry anticipation. I offered him my prey, sacrificing dead prey to quench his thirst and show my loyalty. This hunting experience not only strengthened my skills and strength, but also deepened my bond with Basilisk. June 7th, 1943. That day was marked by an event that shocked the entire Hogwarts community. A bloody inscription appeared on a corridor wall, announcing that Salazar Slytherin's Chamber of Secrets had been opened. My message caused panic and anxiety among the students and teachers. For days now, the school had been abuzz with lively discussions and rumors about who the Slytherin heir might be and what it might mean for the safety of the school. Students had been talking in silence, trying to figure out the truth from the rumors and speculation. I, on the other hand, was watching with delight and schadenfreude. I loved seeing the fear in people's eyes. June 8th, 1943. Amidst the turmoil and uncertainty and the rumors of the students, I decided that my first well-planned Horcrux would be a diary. It was a decision that not only demonstrated my loyalty and heritage to Salazar Slytherin, but also gave me a means to express my thoughts and plans. June 9th, 1943. These days with Basilisk have been a real adventure. We spent a lot of time in the Chamber of Secrets and each time we discovered something new. It was like going into an uncharted forest where there was a mystery around every corner. We didn't just have fun, we exchanged ideas. The basilisk you see not only bit and glared, but he could talk about things. It was like he was wiser than a lot of people. We used to make up our own games, like who can scare the other one the most, and to be honest, sometimes I managed to scare him the most. I never thought snakes could be smarter and more cooperative than humans. June 10th, 1943. Rumors at Hogwarts spread as quickly as fire in dry grass. I've been hearing a lot of different stories lately, some of them as ridiculous as their authors. 
but there are some that make you wonder. One of the most common stories I've heard about concerns the Chamber of Secrets. Of course, most people just laugh at the idea, but I know that behind every legend there can be a grain of truth. June 11th, 1943. Tonight I found Hagrid walking the corridors of Hogwarts. It was unusual because he usually sleeps like a dead man as soon as night falls. But he looked so strange, like something was bothering him. I decided to go over and ask him what had brought him here, but Hagrid waved me off and said he just couldn't sleep. But I could see something unusual in his eyes, as if he was hiding something. It made me wonder. June 12th, 1943. Tomorrow I will make a decision that I have been putting off for a long time. I have decided to let the basilisk out of the Chamber of Secrets. This decision came to me for a reason I thought about it for a long time, weighing all the pros and cons. On the other hand, I realized that the basilisk was a dangerous creature. His gaze could kill a person, and his presence at Hogwarts could be a threat to everyone. It was hard for me to accept that, but I knew I had to act reasonably and responsibly. June 13th, 1943. Opening a chamber of secrets. Something terrible happened today. I killed Myrtle. It was an accident, but now it's too late. I've lost control of the situation. A flash of anger and there she was, lying lifeless in front of me. I couldn't let anyone find out. I had to cover my tracks. So I decided to blame Hagrid. He was at the scene of the crime and his gruff appearance made him the perfect candidate for such a role. No one would have believed that I, the head lord of Slytherin, could have done something like that. Now Hagrid was expelled from Hogwarts and I had created my first Horcrux. June 14th, 1943. Today I got a reward for exposing Hagrid. I had to come forward and tell everyone how he supposedly opened the Chamber of Secrets and was responsible for Myrtle's death. I convinced everyone that it was only through my efforts and attention to detail that his crime was discovered. The reward was inevitable, and I accepted it with a smile on my face. After the award ceremony, I approached Principal Dippet and asked him to keep me in school for the summer holidays. I said that I wanted to use this time to continue my research and teaching. Although my request actually had a very different purpose to stay closer to the Chamber of Secrets and continue my experiments. June 15th, 1943. Today, Dumbledore and many of the students stood up for Hagrid. They claimed he was innocent of Myrtle's death. I was annoyed at how blindly they believed in his innocence without seeing the obvious facts. I tried to convince them that Hagrid was responsible for what had happened, but my words made no difference. Everyone continued to believe in his goodness and purity, unwilling to see the truth of what had happened. Despite my pleas to stay at school for the summer holidays, I was still sent to the orphanage. It wasn't fair, but there was nothing I could do about it. I needed time to continue my research and find a way to achieve my goals. So I decided that while I was in the orphanage, I would finally start looking for my father who abandoned me and find out the truth about my family. Fifteenth August, 1943, two months later. Upon arrival, the shelter greeted me with its usual dreary surroundings. Rust was eating away at the creaking gates, and the plaster of the square building had crumbled in places, exposing the bricks. Time had not done the place any favors, despite the arrival of new children. Those, on the contrary, were only infected by the general atmosphere. They tended to be quieter and rarely had any real fun. Little Hangleton was a small village north of London. The very next night I went there. It was the most dilapidated shack of all, half hidden in a thick thicket of nettles. It stood on the top of a hill, and the path to it was completely overgrown with moss, so that no one in his right mind would live there. When I noticed a dim light in the window, I knocked on the door with force. There was a commotion in the house, but no one opened the door for me, so I kicked it open myself. The house was dusty, dark, and very dirty, with huge cobwebs hanging from the corners. I raised the lantern higher and saw an unkempt man in a chair, so overgrown that from a distance he looked like a wild animal. We stared at each other for a few seconds. 
Then the man jumped up, knocking over empty bottles that tinkled on the floor. The conversation was not very pleasant, and I found out that my mother had given my father a love potion and where he was. I killed him and the rest of his family and took the ring with me, making a horcrux out of it. I felt my eyes turn a red color, and my, my emotions felt like they were dulled. I don't know if I'm going to keep writing in my diary, but one thing I do know is that I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to create seven horcruxes, and I'm going to do everything I can to find the items to make them. This is where I don't say goodbye to you, dear diary. Many more adventures await me, and I will keep these notes in memory of my past.